Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you for the organisers for allowing me to come and give a talk here. Um, currently CEO of a startup, Gary started in April last year. Uh, pre prior to all that, I was an academic for about 20 years working with large industries around Australia, mainly mining, aviation and stevedoring, focusing on not just autonomous robots but also um, autonomous operations. And in parallel to all that, about the last 15 years I've received you know, just over $30 million worth of R&D funding from various RDCs to try and look at what does it mean to build on-farm robots, right? field robotic tools, things that can operate 24-7 in different settings and can do certain tasks on farm. And really around those, that last 15 years was really around exploration of those different types of activities. So the way I've broken up this talk is I'm just going to talk about bots that we built that we thought might be useful for the top 20%, bots that we built that we thought might be useful for everyone else. And then I want to touch a little bit on, on thinking about what does it mean to go from just robots to operations. And, and the reason why I wanted to touch on that is because as growers, as farmers, what you want to be thinking about is what does the operation look like in five, ten years' time to dictate about what you want to do now with the robotic solutions as opposed to the other way around. So I'm just going to touch a little bit on that um, and really just by giving some examples from other industries that we can learn from in Australia. Uh, the first, I'm hoping that there's no volume on this, but the first bot that I'm going to talk about is Ripper. It was built for the horticulture industry, solar electric, 24-hour operation on a good day like today. Uh, runs about 12 hours of batteries, but it runs, the solar energy is just sufficient to kind of move the bot along. Can do real-time AI, detect individual plants, and start to look at things such as crop growth monitoring, um, as well as plant health um, as it's going through. Uh, because you can detect the plant, you can also start to do things like individual plant yield estimation, and that becomes a, a significant tool. And if you can detect the plant, you can also detect other things, such as weeds in this particular case. And a bit, we had a big push in terms of looking at non-chemical weeding, and this is just one of the tools. We developed a whole bunch of different mechanical tools, laser tools, steaming tools, to try and look at how you might remove weeds without any chemical use um, at all. And we also looked at other aspects. So, for example, you'll see here the directed spraying. So this is the targeting every single plant and based on the size of the plant, measuring the right amount of fluid you want to disperse on that individual plant as you're going through. And we also looked at water monitoring and being able to look at water conductivity, so being able to measure the kind of process near a plant. The big thing that I want you to kind of... Oh, actually, I'll show you one more after we go through. This is really just kind of mapping out the, uh, what's going on on the soil. So it's constantly every few metres it's giving you a, a, a sample. Um, the other thing the farmers were always asking us about was, you know, foreign object detection and whether we could actually remove foreign objects. So we just tagged a Ryobi vacuum cleaner, we bolted it on underneath the bot, um, and then we just looked at whether or not you could just detect foreign objects. Remove it. They wanted us to suck up frogs and mulch them, but the university ethics department wasn't going <laughs> to allow any of that, so it was just purely just uh, post-it notes for now. But what I want you to imagine is the capabilities now of what we're getting to, which is this 24-7 this bot that can not only just move up and down and maybe do some weeding tasks or something like that, but you're also detecting individual plants, you're sampling at the soil, you're acting on decisions. So a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about, about information to decision making, is starting to get closer and closer where, that's, where that temporal space is becoming very, very short and it's happening in real time on the bot, on the farm. And hence the relationship between the farm and the bot is more about when you see certain things, this is what I want you to do, and starting to increase that autonomy on farm. We looked at how we could spread the capability of that robotics across the different industries because at the end of the day you don't want to build a robot for a certain farm and then build a different robot for a different farm. You're trying to look at scale and from that scale trying to reduce the cost so that it makes it easier for the farmers to adopt. This is another example of the bot going up and down tree rows. The little white box that you see up the middle there is detecting individual apples, doing crop yield information. Um, as it's going through, we've also looked at detecting flowers as well, so you can start to look at um, assessments between flower and apple count. In this case here, it's got a little viper, you know, which is just firing away fluid. For us as roboticists, we were just mucking around, we just thought, well, we'll just try this, we'll just fire every apple, that looks like fun. Uh, but the growers were coming on and saying, well, that's great, if you can do things like that, then there's directed you know, pest assessments and being able to direct only certain amounts of spray at particular parts of the tree. So it's things like that that we were trying to look at as we, as we spread through. Uh, one of the more recent projects that we're looking at is with the grains industry, and that's looking at green on green mechanical weeding. Um, and again, using the bot, we've just kind of gutted it out a little bit. This little pod that you see on the left there sits underneath. So this pod here sits underneath the bot there. And basically, it's a, um, a, a pod that splits apart the grain plants and then Underneath there, there's a little camera system looking down and it's detecting individual weeds. And if it detects the weeds, it would just mechanically chip away or grind away at that particular weed. Okay, so you'll see here um, the bot's moving along and here it's doing real-time weed detection as it's going through. Detect, you know, turnip grass as well as rye, uh, turnip weed as well as ryegrass. 
Um, so it's just going through that process and, and, and detecting each one of those. And this can operate at, you know, if you're looking at that speed, we can operate probably twice as fast as now. Um, but again, you're looking at 24-7 capability uh, as you're going through. And here you'll see it, this little bottom picture here is just showing you when it comes along and it just kind of little grinder that just chips away at that weed. And just when it sees a weed, it just comes along and it will just grind away. That's just one of the tools. We also looked at, we also looked at laser weeding, um, which, which offers some promise here. Uh, the nice thing about laser weeding is that you can actually direct it to the individual weed and, and at a particular location. If you get the frequency of the laser beam right, you actually boil the cells on the inside of the plant. So you're not actually bursting the plants into flames or anything like that. It's really kind of like an internal self-destruction process. So if you can just kind of get it, it's almost like microwaving it. But if you can get it right, you can actually boil the, the cells internally or destruct, destruct the cells internally. Uh, something completely different, we're looking at um, other bots, so this was for the grazing livestock industry. I'll, I'll pause just for a second before I play it. This one here is a swag bot, we called it, but it's a four-wheel drive, four-wheel steer bot. It has a little pivot point on the middle, so it allows it to go over logs and rocks and into ditches and so forth. When, the, when we first put this into the industry, the growers were like, oh great, we want you to herd the animals. And so we did the classic thing, which is drive the bot into the animals and watch all the animals run away, and nothing worked at the end of it all. Um, but what we then realised was that as the robot spent more and more time on the farm and also with the farmer, the animals got used to the bot. Okay? And so then all we had to do was kind of put this little trailer on the back with a bit of hay and just move wherever we wanted to go and the animals would just follow behind us. So it was a bit of a Pied Piper approach. But what the, what the growers were interested in is if the bot can measure things like pasture quality and pasture biomass, quality is still a very hard element, we can't do that one yet, but pasture biomass, then you move the animals to whatever location you want and then you can you know, have them grazing. Uh, but at the same time, what you can do is that this is in a, in a dairy pump. At the same time, what you can do is you've got the laser units that are on the bot. So as you're moving around the animals, you're also detecting the animals themselves. And you can actually apply machine learning techniques on the data and start to see the walking gait function of the individual animal. And so what that, happens, what that means is that if their walking function, their gait, actually changes week on week, then that's an alert for the grower. So you're moving the bots around, sorry, you're moving the bot around, you're measuring pasture, you're getting the animals to move with you, and you're also detecting their behaviour at the, at the same time. And, and, and the other third area that the farmers were interested in was weed detection. This is the bot running around in real time detecting serrated tussock um, as it's going through. It's navigating, looking at obstacles, moving around obstacles, detecting where the weeds are. And it comes along and it positions itself on the top of each weed and it drops down this little weed spray and it just sprays. And in our case, we just sprayed some dye uh, just to mark out what was going on. But it would just come along and just spray on the weed. And this is where you can start to see the cape, you know, the reason why we went the four wheel drive, the four wheel steer, just to get that precision and being able to detect individual plants uh, as we're going through. Okay. So that's on, on, on some of the on, on some of the mid site. Most of these bots are probably uh, let's say a four square meter, right? Two meters by two meters. That's the kind of rough size that you've got. Um, and the cost of these bots can get quite high because the farmers that are interested in the bots are not just interested in the the labour saving aspects, but also the crop intelligence or the animal intelligence that comes in. So the sensing capabilities, the algorithms that come through all kind of phrase it. But we also looked at what does it mean to kind of uh, look at the other 80% um, um, of growers out there. And we, we kind of, this was a, about six years ago. This is like a, almost like an inverted segue. There's some smarts in the wheels that allows us to kind of just uh, bolt together quite quickly within about 15 minutes. Uh, you know, the wheels, that, that bar that you see in the middle can change for different row widths. And what it means is that you can kind of roll it out into the back of a vehicle, go from one paddock to another paddock, put it together and you start uh, collecting some data. Um, you'll see soon the, the bot here moving down. It's got the sensor pad down the bottom. The rocking motion that you see there is part of the reason why we look at stability just in terms of two, wheel, two wheels. But when it comes to the algorithms, the algorithms can detect the motion of that sensor platform. So it stitches it all together as if you were flying a drone. But what this gives us is a six hour battery life. So we operate for a lot longer, we can go for a lot further. And the resolution can, is much higher because it actually goes down closer to the crop. Um, and, and so you can use, start using low cost sensors as well. We've done a number of different trials with growers uh, all around the country, different local land services demonstrating the capability of it. If you, if you look out the front here, if you can just see it, there's this little 
thing that's sticking out there and on the top there. That's a selfie stick. It's gimbal so it's just an off-the-shelf selfie stick. We put a smartphone on it, and then we use the smartphone because it's got the best computational capability and camera sensor that you could buy for a few hundred bucks. So all you're doing is you're tapping into it now, and you're extracting out the information, and you're running the algorithms uh, in real time. And you kind of see this kind of thing process happening. So that's a selfie stick with a smartphone on it. And it's gimbal so it keeps everything nice and flat. It's just doing yield estimates. Um, we can also do things like uh, seeding and spraying, and it, the, the phone talks to the rest of the, the system as you're going through. Part of the drive around building this tech for those small growers is also what we can do around the digital divide because it's you know from Sydney, and so it's great. You've got all this powerhouse of knowledge and geeks who want to kind of run AI algorithms and that, but what do you do about the farmers who are out in the middle of the rural areas? How do you support them? The last thing you want is collecting all this data shipping a gigabyte of data across the Sydney, us analysing and feeding back. So a lot of our drive has also been about how do we build the community around there. We've had a program now and we just got funded again by the New South Wales government. Uh, we're actually rolling out the robots across 20 rural schools in, in New South Wales. And it's quite an important element because we actually leave the robot with the school for 10 weeks for a whole term. And we give them material that's connected to the curriculum, the Australian curriculum. And the kids learn about technology and ag, but in the context of the robot. And they get to program the robot. They learn everything from GPS right at the beginning all the way through to machine learning right at the end and how it gets used on the, on the farm. And the whole idea is to kind of encourage the kids, ag is great, ag tech's coming, stay on farm, et cetera. But also to kind of build up that community around the farmer and around that digital technology <laughs> process. And it's an interesting area because when you talk about robotics and the future of robotics on farm, one of the things that kind of battles us at the moment now is are we building the robot for the 40, 50, 60 year old farmer or are we building the robot for the 20 year old farmer because they're completely different user interfaces. For the 20 year old farmer, the ones coming across in five years, I'm just going to throw a joystick at them and I'll walk away and they'll do everything from there. And when, you, when you're looking at the older growers, you actually have to sit down and you have to think about the user interfaces, the methods, the processes, whatever, and that, you know, makes things a lot more complex. And that's the kind of scenario that we're working at with robotics is, is kind of dealing with the current situation now, but also how, what do we need to do about the next generation. Uh, we also got some funding from the government to actually take this spot across to <laughs> Indonesia, uh, Samoa and Fiji. And um, I'll just stop it there for a second. And you might think, well, why would you take it to the Pacific Islands, right? They're exactly the same problems with the growers that we have here. Um, Dad's going off into the city because they need dual incomes, left with mum at home working on the farm. Kids don't want to work on the farm. They've gone off the city, tried to get a tertiary education, moved on from there. Um, and so you're getting lots of cooperatives, mainly uh, women-driven cooperatives that are coming together um, to try and deal with the issues on farm. They can't deal with agronomy services that easily. No one goes out onto their farms and helps them. Um, any of them, usually generally the chemicals that they use are, are, are cheap. Yeah, they have to get them cheap because of the economics that they have that come from China. It's all in Chinese. They can't read it. And they can't deal with the pests and, and diseases that they've got. They don't understand it. So being able to come in with a solution that can provide that crop intelligence as well as that labour-saving elements for these farmers is actually a big thing. And so we, we, we did some trials out across those three islands. Um, this is – you don't need all these people. They, you know, they were just standing – Oh, it's an interesting story. When we went to Samoa, this was this is about 300 kilogram bot. It was in a crate. We got there and it was still in the crate in the corner. And we thought, how'd they get it off the back of the the ute onto there? And we needed it moved. And we're like, we could looking for a forklift and we couldn't find it anywhere. And the guy at the hotel just called up four of his mates. And I just <laughs> Picked them big Samoans, right? They just picked up this thing and moved it across. And so what they thought was, you know, you've got to worry about this thing. But this is just hinched down um, as you go through the back of the ute. So it's just a hinge in it. goes uh, hitch, sorry, and it just goes through. Um, and then it's the same kind of concept. You've got this bot that's going through, cheap sensors, looking down, providing crop yield information and, and um, sensory information, as well as being able to do certain tasks uh, on farm. And... We modified the same bot to look at tree crops. So in this particular example, this is the digital farmhand. It's meant to be the low cost version, just trying to, it's almost like a two wheeled electric tractor, but with dolly wheels on it, allows us to put all the sensors on board and, and off we go from there. Um, the capability of this particular bot was about um, four to five hours of, of battery life. Uh, but what it's doing here, it's, don't look at the spraying, it's just us having a bit of fun, but they're independent actuated nozzles. And what it's doing is detecting the yield of fruit on the tree and based on the yield, estimating which of those nozzles should move where in order to be able to target and spray at that particular point. So it's, it's really putting robotics and intelligence together but doing it in real time, okay? And that's really what the, what the, what the focus is. So in April last year, uh, 
a lot of that technology got spun out. We, we got uh, three investors that come through, it gave us one of the largest ag tech seed funds, about $8 million, uh, to kind of really put about 12 engineers together and start to take out the technology and start to commercialise and work directly with the growers uh, in that way. The first thing that we've got out is the digital farmhand. It's, it's that lower cost entry point. Um, it's, it's, looks, it's a small bot, it's about, um, uh, uh, it could, the width can go about 1.8 metres, the fitter grows rows, or even two metres in some cases, but it's adjustable as you can see there, and it's about one and a half metres long. Um, so we can adjust there, but in these red boxes here is where all the energy drive and the battery systems are, and the black box that you've got up the front is where all the smarts are. And what that means is that we can come along and configure the bot for different types of arrangements and that just makes makes it more adaptable and usable across different size farms. It's quite capable, it can move at about um, six kilometres per hour at, at top speed. We can adjust the speed, it's a torque speed relationship. It has a seven to ten hour battery life and we've towed a Land Cruiser uh, with it. So it's quite a capable bot, it's even for its small size and that gives you a perspective of the kind of energy that we've got now. This is just a, a video kind of showing the uh, the latest results that came out of the, uh, the bots. So this is on one of the farms out in Greater Sydney. Um, ignore the noise. Yeah. So this is just us adjusting it and we can adjust it for different uh, widths. It's doing broccoli estimation. One of the things is trying to measure different size broccoli for selective harvesting and that's one of the kind of areas that we're looking at. Here it's doing real-time weed detection amongst in a carrot farm um, on the bottom left and it also does row following. So it's not just GPS guided, it's following rows, it's doing obstacle detection, noticing when there's an end of a row, being able to do a turn autonomously and coming across uh, back into the, um, uh, into the row again. So we're trialling uh, this spot. We've got a number of early adopter growers, both in Victoria and New South Wales, and we're going to be positioning ourselves with those growers, and, and it's going to be on farm, and we're really working towards that commercial strategy of, not, it's not just weeding and spraying, but looking at the digital agronomy element as well. So how do we do you know, the individual plant detection, what does that mean for the farmer, and what does that mean back in terms of the operation? So the last thing I wanted to touch on was just how we move from robotics to operations. And, and, the, and again, you, there's a lot of hype around the robotics, uh, which is good, right? They're coming, the tech's coming, it's, it's going to get better and better, it's going to get cheaper and cheaper. And that's one of the things as, as farmers, you've just got to it, it, it just accept the fact that it's coming along. So the question from an operational perspective is, is how you use it within the context of operations. I want to bring out three examples of, of projects that I've worked on. But also there are Australian examples that we can learn from. Uh, if you go to Port Brisbane, Port Melbourne, uh, Port Sydney, you'll see that there are autonomous straddle carriers moving around autonomously 24-7. We developed all that tech for them. You know about mining and what's going on in, in, in Perth, the whole mine operations that are going out in the Pilbara. Again, we developed the tech for Rio Tinto in that space. And recently you would have heard about the London to Sydney and New York to Sydney direct routes and we developed a lot of flight planning algorithms for Qantas in that space. But what you see in that trend is this focus on what does the future state look like and hence what is the technology that we need to get to at that point. So as an example, if I was a horticulture grower and I knew this technology was coming, what does an autonomous farm look like in five years' time? Or what state will that look like? And maybe not, and not, not everything will be automated, but what are the things that will be automated? What does that mean in the context of my operations uh, becomes another question. And all of these guys have got examples of things that the agriculture industry can learn from. And they're already there, already set in place from standards, WHS, how do you run autonomous operations and so forth. And I'm just going to bore you with the, it shouldn't be the last slide, but I will try and, you know, I just want you to kind of see it in this context. This is a, this is an activity of, of a mine operation. And this is the number of years across here. And this is how much uncertainty there is. And in the light blue, what you have there is what the current operations are. So the higher the value, the more uncertain everything is. And what you see in the dark blue is the current operations. So in other words, they've got more information about what's going on on their farm. And because they have more information, they have better decision making. But what's more important is in the process of automating some of these things, there are many on-mine tasks that have been completely removed from the operation. So in that context, when you're looking at the situation about your farm, you're not just, you're not just looking at it and saying, oh, these are the tasks that I can automate. But if you look at it from a longer term horizon, there are certain tasks that if you automate it, there are other tasks that you don't need to do anymore. Okay, and it's that thinking, that looking ahead over the next five, ten years, that's going to help not only yourself in terms of understanding how to bring in the technology, but it's also going to help all the ag tech providers understand what the key points are that need to be brought across. So that's the presentation. Thank you. Free time.